Hi everyone, I'm Nikki Vachon. I'm a College Access Counselor with the Finance Authority of Maine. And today we're gonna to do a FAFSA demonstration. So I'm gonna demonstrate the 2021-22 FAFSA. Um, but before we start, I wanna mention, please join our mailing list at famemaine.com slash join. Um, so we can email you every October when it's time to do your FAFSA again and tell you all the ways that fame can help you. Also make sure you follow us on social media because we have awesome content that we put out to let you know what's happening with financial aid. So I'm going to do a FAFSA demonstration over all the sections of the FAFSA. But if you have a question about just a single part of it, look down below in the description to see where each section is in this video. Before we start, I want to have some tech tips. So you want to make sure you have the best experience possible in doing the FAFSA, right? So just make sure your web browser is the most up-to-date version. I find that Firefox, um, I have the least amount of issues with, so I always recommend using Firefox. And make sure that your browser um, allows pop-ups on the fafsa.gov website. Um, the FAFSA does have several things that pop up. You just want to make sure that's enabled. Okay, here are the steps to file the FAFSA. Easy peasy, we can do this, guys. So the first thing that you need to do as a student is to create a username and password with Federal Student Aid. So you're gonna go to studentaid.gov and you're gonna create an account. I'm gonna show you how to do this. This account is known as the FSA ID or Federal Student Aid ID. This is the username and password that you're gonna to use to get into the FAFSA. But then also this is how you sign your FAFSA. That username and password is your electronic signature. Um, a parent is also going to need an FSA ID, username and password, if parent information is needed on your FAFSA. So just one of your parents, um, if your parent information is needed, keep in mind, they're gonna need to set one of these up as well. If your parent has already set up their FSA ID in the past, maybe you had an older brother or sister that needed to do their FAFSA. So um, maybe you have a parent that did an FSA ID. They don't need to create a brand new one for you. They need to recover what, <laughs> what theirs was. So they just need to remember that FSA ID they created before. And if they get stuck, give us a call at Fame and we can help you recover your username and password. Um, then you're gonna actually submit the FAFSA and this takes like maybe 20 minutes, so not long at all. And then the final step after you submit the FAFSA is there is some follow-up. So we just wanna make sure that people know the FAFSA is not the last step in applying for financial aid, but it's a good chunk of it. Okay. So let's just start with setting up your FSA ID. You're creating an account with studentaid.gov. So you're gonna to go to studentaid.gov and you're gonna click on create an account. Once you get in, you're gonna see who are the people that will need an FSA ID. So you can see here parents, students, and borrowers. So if you take out a student loan, you need to have this FSA ID username and password to sign your loan application. Um, this is going to tell you all the things that you can do with this FSA ID, the things that you're going to need. So you're going to need your social security number, super important. You want to make sure that we're entering that correctly. So if you have your social security card with you, awesome. That's going to be super helpful. You are also going to need to have access to either a cell phone number that can receive a text or an email that you can access anywhere. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. You need to have one or the other of these to set this up. And the reason that they do that is because we're gonna set this up using either a cell phone or an email address as a way to reset your password when you can't remember what it is. So you're gonna to have to have access to that when you set this up. I'd love to you to have access to both when you set this up. But if you only have one, so maybe you don't have a cell phone, just have an email address. So you're gonna click on get started. And then you're going to see there's seven parts to set up your FSA ID. This is the first section where it's asking for your name, date of birth, and social security number. Make sure to use your legal name, super important. Um, and make sure that your date of birth and social security number are 100% accurate. What happens behind the scene when you do this is that when you hit submit on this application, your record goes to the Social Security Administration records to see if everything matches. So just make sure it's 100% correct. Um, there is a way to, as you're typing the Social Security number to 
uh, make sure that you can see it because you really want to make sure that that you don't have a typo with your social security number super important. Okay, so we're now on step two of setting up your FSA ID where you're going to create a username. You can choose any username you'd like as long as no one else has chosen it yet. So as you type this and you go to the next tab, you'll see if it's available. If it's not, it'll be a red error message and you just have to use something else. The email address that you're going to use, you're going to enter it here and then confirm it. Um, I always recommend that people don't use your high school email address. So after high school, sometimes um, your old email addresses get shut down or I even work with some schools where um, outside entities like me at FAME can't email to students at their high school email address. It's kind of a, a security protocol. So sometimes um, the federal government may be trying to send you an email and they maybe can't because of that safety protocol. So choose a personal email address that we know that you're gonna have access to for a really long time. Okay, we're gonna set up the password and the password is made up of a combination of uppercase, lowercase uh, letters, numbers. It has to be at least eight characters long. As you meet one of these criteria, it's gonna check off that you've met it. And then once this is a, a good enough password, it'll say criteria met and you can use that password. Um, definitely want to say show password here so you can see what you're typing and then you're going to confirm it. So just a word about your password. Your password cannot include your name, birthday, or social security number. Just a security precaution there. Again, always click show password just to make sure you are not typing in any typos. You want to make sure you know what you've typed in. And then most importantly, write this down. Write down your username, your email address, your password. As you create your FSA ID, super important to write everything down and keep that information in a safe place. You're going to need this FSA ID for a really long time, maybe 14 years. So just keep in mind that you want to make sure you write it down, maybe store it in your phone or whatever it is that helps you. Having it a couple different ways, super helpful. Now we're on step three. This is where you're going to list your address and your mobile phone number. So um, this is where that mobile phone number that you're going to enter here, when you check off that you do want to use this for account recovery. What that means is when you can't remember your password or your username, you can get a six digit code texted to you. You can enter that code into the website and you can have your username shown to you or you can reset your password. This is what's called a verified mobile phone number. This also means that you can use your verified mobile number as your username. If you can't remember the username you chose, once you set this up, once you link that cell phone to this FSA ID, you can then use it as your username. We're at communication preferences, and this is really just asking, how do you want federal student aid to communicate with you? Do you prefer email, postal mail, or text message. Um, and also you can choose which language you prefer, English or Spanish. We're going to get to this part where it's going to ask you to set up challenge questions. So this is where you're going to choose um, from a drop down challenge questions that um, have to be between, the answers have to be between, between three and 50 characters long. Uh, they can only contain uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, or spaces. This cannot include like special characters. Um, your answer is not case sensitive, so it doesn't really matter how you set this up. It could be uppercase or lowercase, um, and you can't reuse your challenge question answers. So choose one of the one of the options and set up your challenge questions. Okay, so now we're almost near the end. We're at the verify section where you're going to be able to look everything that you set up. And if you need to change anything, you can click on that edit box. You're going to agree to the terms and conditions and then hit continue. This is where we're going to connect your cell phone number or your email address, hopefully both. I like to have a lot of options. Um, so you're going to click on verify whichever one you see here. And then you're going to see once you click on, like I clicked on verify my mobile phone number, this pop-up happens where it says, You've just been sent a text. Check your phone, find that six digit code and enter it here. 
that is going to connect your cell phone number to this FSA ID. You're gonna do the same thing with your verify my email address. Once you click that, this pop-up comes up, check your email. You've got an email from Federal Student Aid. I believe the subject is action required. That has a six digit code in it. You're gonna plug that in and hit continue. All right, so at that point, your FSA ID is set up. Congratulations, way to go. So just important, I wanna reiterate, it's very important that as you set this up, that all of your data matches. After you hit submit on that FSA ID application, that record is gonna to go to social security and check to make sure everything is correct. You're gonna get an email back that says, way to go. This all matches and you can use your FSA ID or something's wrong. You have to log back into studentaid.gov, figure out what you did wrong, correct it and resubmit it. So super important, just make sure you get that correct. Make sure you write this down. I cannot say this enough. We created um, this worksheet that you see here, and we have this on our um, FAME website, famemain.com. You can see the link down at the bottom, where you can either download and print this for free, or if you don't have a printer at home, just use this as a template. Uh, I just want to make sure that you're writing down your username, your password, the cell phone number that you use to the email address, and your challenge questions. Now, there's a part up here for the student to put their information. And then we also on the same page have a place for parents to put their information as they set up their username and password. Super important. Then keep this in a safe place. Um, I also do wanna mention that when you set up your FSA ID and you verify your mobile phone and your email address, that phone number and email address can only be used once. So let's say you have a family email address and you set up your FSA ID using that family email when your parent goes to set up their FSA ID, they can't use that same email address because you've already used it. So pro tips there. Again, I'd like to say don't use your high school email address because again, they can be shut down after high school, after you graduate, you may not be able to have access to it. Also, just so you know, when you're setting up your FSA ID, those codes that are sent to you are only good for 30 minutes. So make sure you're in a place where you can receive texts and email. So I always have people either try their cell phone number to see if they can get a text, open up your email, just make sure that that's working out okay. Okay, so before we dive into the FAFSA, I do wanna let you know that we have created this worksheet where um, you can print this or download it and print it or just look at it. Um, this is a checklist of all the things that you need before you sit down to do your FAFSA. So I've got a checklist of things that you're gonna need. And if you can see right at the top, you're gonna need your FSA ID. So go ahead and download this. I think it's gonna be super helpful as you sit down to do your FAFSA. Okay, I got all my stuff together to do the FAFSA. So I'm ready to get started. When you go to fafsa.gov, you're going to see that there's two options to get into your FAFSA. You can either click on start here if you've never been to this website before, but if you've been in your FAFSA before, then you're gonna to wanna to click login. The next screen is asking you, are you the student or the parent? I always recommend that people click on, I am the student to get into their FAFSA, because when you do that, you will see there's a place to enter in the student's username and password, that FSA ID that we just set up a few minutes ago. So if you can see here, you can enter in either the username that you chose or a verified email address or mobile phone number. So when you link your FSA ID by getting a text, you link your FSA ID to your cell phone, you can then use that as your username. So that's pretty cool. Then you're gonna click on your password and enter that. If you don't remember what it is or you're entering it in, take your time here. Um, after so many attempts, you might get locked out, which is not a big deal. You can reset your password, but just take your time. Less frustration. When you get into the FAFSA, it's asking you what academic year are you going to need financial aid? So you can see right here that you can either start a 2021-22 FAFSA or for this is for current students who are in school now or will be in school in the, um, the spring semester. So keep in mind that you wanna make sure you're choosing the right year. For this demonstration, we're gonna show you the 21-22 FAFSA. 
When you get in, the first thing it's going to ask you to do is create a save key. This is just a temporary password that you set up can be anything it has to be at least four characters long. Um, just it's a if we have to leave the application and go back in, we're just going to need to know what that is. Um, once we submit your FAFSA, this save key goes away. So it's just a temporary password. Okay, now we're into the actual FAFSA. And you can see the sections are at the top. It's sort of like a progression bar. And once you complete one section, you can then jump back and forth between the sections. But for right now, we just started and this is kind of grayed out. Um, keep in mind that this says student information in the upper left-hand corner. That's telling me who the information is that I am entering it about. So sometimes people get in and think they immediately enter information about their parents not true. Right in this section, we're asking about student information. When you get to the parent sections, this flag will change to parent information. So when you use a username and password to get into the FAFSA, it preloads all of your data, your last name, your first name, your social date of birth. So you just keep going until there's something you need to enter. So you can see your email address is already here. You can enter a, a phone number and an address. Just make sure that this information that you are entering is what the financial aid office is going to receive. So you want to make sure that you are entering information like where you want that mail to be sent from the financial aid office. Then you're going to have a question saying, have you lived in Maine for at least five years? Um, this is for, I'm just demonstrating for a Maine residence. Um, this is uh, important to know for if whether or not you qualify for Maine State Grant. So that's why this question is asked. Also, you're going to be asked if you are a U.S. citizen. So if you take a look at what your options are in that drop down box, you can either choose, yes, I am a U.S. citizen, no, but I'm an eligible non citizen, or no, but I'm not a citizen or an eligible non citizen. If you are unsure about what to enter here, you can always click on these little question mark icons. This has so much information and it's plain language. It's not a lot of technical terms. So go ahead and click on that and that's gonna give you infor more, more information about who's an eligible non-citizen. Um, if you choose that you are an eligible non-citizen, you will need to enter in your alien registration number. So make sure you have that with you. Okay, so a little bit further down, it's asking about your high school completion status when you start the 2021 academic year. So in the drop down box, you can see, will you have a diploma? Will you have a GED? Were you homeschooled or none of the above? Uh, the next question people always have questions about is what um, degree program will you be working on? Really, they're just thinking about best guess here doesn't have to be like solid written in stone that you know that you're working towards a bachelor's degree. That's a four-year degree. Maybe you're kind of on the fence about whether or not you'd be a two-year degree or four-year degree. Just keep in mind, all I want you to do here is your best guess about what degree program you're going to be in. If you select associate's degree, but then later on the, down the road, you decide you want to be in a four-year bachelor program, financial aid office can fix this for you. So don't stress about that one. Um, the question here is what grade level will you be at? And this always, always makes some questions come about because students are maybe taking early college level classes. Maybe you're in high school now and you're taking some college level classes that you're going to get credit for. That is not necessarily the case of you ever haven't attended college. Um, I always tell people who are in high school who have not graduated yet your grade level is going to be never attended college first year. Um, anything below that if for someone who's actually been a fully matriculated college student. So again, this is one of those questions where not a deal breaker. If you don't, you know, put in the right year, don't stress about it. It's not too big a deal. Next question is, are you interested in work study? Work study is a job on campus where you can work some hours, earn a paycheck, and then a lot of students use that to, you know, pay for gas or laundry or living expenses or to buy books. Um, I always tell people, I recommend saying yes to this question. It doesn't necessarily give you work study, but it maybe gives you the option to have it. Remember that even if you are 
awarded work study, maybe the financial aid office said that they have a work study program and you could earn some money, you still have to apply for a job and work hours and get a paycheck. So I always recommend people say yes to that, but you answer however you feel like that's going to work for you. Um, the next question is going to say, are you male or female? And the reason they're asking this is to determine if you are a male student over the age of 18, you need to register for selective service for a wide variety of reasons. But in order to get federal financial aid, you have to have been registered for selective service. So if you say you are a male, um, it's going to ask if you've registered for selective service. If you have not registered for selective service, you can say no. The next question that pops up is do you want the FAFSA to do it for you? So just keep in mind that's an option if you haven't done it yet or you can go to the post office or your town hall and register for selective service. You can actually even do it online. The next question is asking you to enter in your driver's license. A lot of people stress out because maybe you don't have a driver's license. You don't necessarily have to put this in. Um, the next question is asking if you were ever in the foster care system. And if you say yes to this, at the end of the FAFSA, it will show you information about programs for um, students who were in foster care. Then it's going to ask about the highest level of education completed by your parents. And the reason why this is asked, um, or one of the reasons I found in my career is that many times the financial aid office might have a scholarship for first generation students. That means that your parents didn't go to college. So um, don't breeze by this one because you are not sure about this. Make sure you find out because I want to make sure that if you qualify for one of those scholarships that you get it. Um, as you go along, you're going to be able to see that your application does get successfully saved. But I always recommend as you go at the top, there is another place to save. So I'm a frequent saver. I don't know about you guys. Um, the next question is really asking about um, whether or not you're eligible for, for financial aid because there's some ways that you can lose financial aid. So little known secret here, um, it's going to ask if you've ever received federal financial aid. If you answer yes to this, this question pops up. Have you been convicted for possession or sale of illegal drugs? If you do get caught um, or convicted of selling or possessing illegal drugs while receiving federal money, you could lose financial aid. So just to keep that in mind. Okay, now we've moved on to the school selection section. So if you can see here, now this one section is done, it's green. We've now moved on to the school selection page. So this does two things. We're gonna first list the high school that we're graduating from or whatever that we get our high school credentials at. And then we're gonna list all the colleges you're thinking about applying to. So you're gonna look for your high school by entering in the name of your high school, the city where it's located or the state, you can click on search. It will pull up a list of all of the high schools in that area and you select the one where you are going to get your high school diploma. Um, I'll keep it that you can click that search there. Then you're gonna to get to the section where it says, list all of the colleges that you are thinking about applying to. You don't necessarily need to know where you're gonna to go to college. And in fact, most people who do this, they're not sure yet. So this gives you the option of listing up to 10 colleges. So list all of the schools you're thinking about applying to, and then um, you're gonna move on. But just to give you an idea here, um, it's asking if you know the school code, that's a six digit code. If you do know it, you can say yes. I don't know many people that do. So if you say no, you can find the school by searching for the state. Um, the city and the school name are optional. I often work with a lot of students who um, have several schools in Maine. So I say just choose the Maine as the state and it's gonna find you all the colleges in Maine and you can sift through that list and check off all this, the colleges you're thinking about. If you're thinking about going to a school in Boston that has a ton of colleges, I always like to filter down a little bit more by actually putting in the city and the school name. So you can see here, I chose Maine and showing you what the list looks like when you, when you see a bunch of schools, it's in alphabetical order. You're gonna check off all the schools that you're thinking about applying to. Just also wanted to mention that if you have more than 10 schools you are interested in, 
you're going to submit this FAFSA with your first 10 of your most likely schools. After your FAFSA is processed, you can go back into the section and override some of those schools that are already in there. So you're just going to remove some and then add new ones. Now that doesn't take away your FAFSA from that school. That school that you list, listed initially, they've already got your FAFSA. So don't worry about that. This is just gonna, you're gonna list new schools, hit submit, and it's gonna go out to the next batch of schools. So that's how that works. The next section is saying, what are your housing plans at each of the schools you're interested in? So I chose three schools randomly. Um, you're gonna choose, you know, do you wanna live on campus, off campus, or with your parents? You don't necessarily need to know. Again, this is just gonna be a best guess. Um, I always tell people if you are on the fence about possibly living on campus, choose on campus because there might be some on campus housing grants that the financial aid office may have. So I always say it's always good to know what money's available in case you're not really sure. So we've now moved into the section to determine whether or not you are a dependent or independent student. Now, what that means is the FAFSA is going to ask you a series of questions to determine if your parents' information is needed on the FAFSA. So if um, you meet any of the qualifications to be considered independent, no parent information is needed on your FAFSA. So I'm just going to walk through these steps and then show you what that's going to look like on the back end. So when you move to the dependency status section, it's going to ask first what you, the student, what is your marital status as of today? Are you single, married, divorced, widowed? Um, what is your marital status? The next question is, if you have anyone that you financially support, so do you have any children or will you have any children between July 21st, or July 1st, 2021 and June 30, 2022? Um, the next question is, do you have any other dependents, maybe not children, but other people you might financially support? And this is people that you are providing more than 50% of the financial support for them. So I'm going to answer no to these questions. And when you can't answer yes to this, it just keeps moving to the next dependency question. Um, the next question is asking whether or not you are a veteran. Um, if you are in foster care since age 13, or since age 13, were you a ward of the court um, or an orphan? Um, have you been an emancipated minor? Meaning, have you um, gone to court to separate yourself from your parents? Um, or does anyone other than a parent have legal guardianship over you? And what that means is um, you've had to go to court and someone has said that they are actually gonna be your legal guardian. So it's important that you know that these are things that you have to go to court to get official court documents of. Um, and if you do choose one of these, that that is your situation, you're probably going to have to send a copy of the court order to your financial aid office so they can put in your file. If you say none of these, you're still being asked about dependency questions. You'll be asked on or after July 1st of 2020, were you homeless or were you self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? Um, this is a question I always recommend that if people are not sure how to answer that to give us a call and we can work you through it or you can check the little question mark here to get a little bit more information. If you were homeless or believe you were self-supporting and at risk of homelessness, this box will check pop up saying, okay, who can document the situation for you? Is it going to be someone at your high school? They have a, um, a homeless student liaison. Um, or is it someone at a shelter or um, a transitional living program? Maybe there's someone there that can help document this situation for you. If it's none of the above, that's fine. Um, maybe you're just going to have a conversation with the financial aid office and they can document your situation there. So if the FAFSA is leading you down a path where you are going to be considered a dependent student, you'll see the screen here that says, Okay, it sounds like you're a dependent student. Are you able to provide parent information? Now, most people, I think when they get to this situation will say I will provide parent inf information about my parents. But some people don't fit into that FAFSA definition of what is a dependent student. 
if you are a student who's in danger of contacting a parent or maybe you don't know where your parents are or they're incarcerated and it's very difficult to have them complete the FAFSA, there are other situations where you can say, I'm unable to provide information about my parents. And we can work through that. We can work with the financial aid office to, to see what your situation is and document that. Please give us a call of fame to help walk you through that. We're absolutely help, happy to do that for you. Um, just want to mention that this is not a question where you maybe aren't with your parents. Maybe they're at work. So you don't want to say, I'm unable to provide information because that wouldn't fit your situation. If you were determined independent because you maybe have children or maybe you're married or maybe you're in legal guardianship, the FAFSA has deemed that you are an independent student, meaning this, the household information going forward, they're going to ask questions about the household. The household is about just the student and not parents. So no parent information is going to be needed. If you're considered an independent student, the next screen you're going to see is tell us about your household. How many people are in your household? Well, we know that's just you, the student. Are you married? Do you have any children? So the, this is sort of how the, the FAFSA diverges into two different pathways. Okay, so now we're going to talk about two different sections in this, this piece. We're going to talk about um, the parent demographic section and the financial information section. So what we're going to cover here is if you're a dependent student, meaning parent information is going to need it, be needed on your FAFSA, you're going to see this pop up where you need to enter your, your parent information. If you are an independent student and no parent information is needed, you're not going to even see this you're not going to be able to answer these questions. It's going to go straight to financial information where it's going to ask for your household size, meaning how many people have to live on the income you're about to list on the FAFSA. Um, and then it's going to ask about finances. So we're going to ask about income that you had in 2019. So keep in mind that if you are an independent student, I'm going to show um, the parent financial information because the student financial information is gonna be the same exact questions. Just keep in mind that you're gonna be answering this about you, the student, and not your parents. So just keep in mind that I'm gonna, that's why I'm putting information about this all together. I'm just gonna show you what it looks like when you put in parent information, but just keep in mind student information for financials is exactly the same. So let's start with parent demographics. So it's going to ask, as of today, what is the marital status of your parents? And I want to say, as of today, is one of those crucial things that we look at because our options are um, your parents never married, um, maybe they're unmarried but still living together. I, I have a lot of parents that aren't married but they're still in the same household. Um, are your parents married or remarried? Maybe your biological parents has divorced, but since then, maybe you live with your dad and dad has remarried. So that would be a, re, a married situation because as of today, dad is married. Um, are they divorced or separated? So even if they have not legally gone through a divorce, you can choose separated as well. The last option is widowed. So meaning one of the, um, the spouses have passed. Okay, so if you are not sure who to list, this is something that we get often. Who do I list as my parent on the FAFSA? Studentaid.gov has this beautiful flow chart where it starts here with, are your parents married to each other? If they are, you're going to report information about both parents on your FAFSA. But let's just say your parents are not married to each other. No. Well, do your parents live together? So even if they are unmarried and live together, yes, you would list the information of both, both, both parents. If your parents don't live together, which parent did you live with the most over the past 12 months? So if you listed with one more than the other, you're going to report the information about the student you lived with the most during the past 12 months. A lot of people say, wait, but you know, dad claims them on his taxes. That's totally fine. It's not about that. It's about who the student lived with the most in the past 12 months. Now, if you live with both parents 50-50, it's absolutely like, halfway you're with mom, halfway with, you're with your other parent, um, just keep in mind, you're going to then list the parent that provides most of your financial support. 
So keep in mind that um, for both of these questions, if your parents have divorced um, and then remarried, you do need to include step parent information as well. A lot of people think it's just biological. No, it's going to be step parents included as well. Um, people that unless they um, are your parents or have legally adopted you, they're not on your FAFSA. So if you live with a grandparent, grandparents information is, are not on your FAFSA unless they have adopted you. So this is great information about whose information is on your FAFSA. That's at studentaid.gov. Okay, so now we've figured out which parent we're going to put on the FAFSA. So I chose that I have my parents are married or remarried. So the next question is we need the demographic information about your parent. Notice this flag up top has changed to parent information. So we're gonna list the information about parent one. This is first parent. I just want you to consider that it's gonna be important later on to remember which was parent one. Um, they're gonna ask for a social security number, last name, first initial, that's their first name. A lot of people put middle initial here. Make sure it's first initial parents date of birth and an email address if your parents have an email address you want to list. Um, super important to get this information correct as well. Now if the parent has married or remarried this is where parent two information is going to go. That's important to remember which parent is parent two. It's going to be needed later on. We're going to put that parent's social security number, last name, first initial, and date of birth. Have your parents lived in Maine for at least five years? Now, this is, again, important to list. If they have lived in Maine, this is an important factor to figure out if they qualify for a Maine state grant. So another reason for that question. The next section here is if you are um, a dependent student and you have to list parent information, they want to know how many people live in your parents' household. How many people are your parents financially supporting? We're counting numbers here. So in my FAFSA, I have two parents and me, I'm one person. So we're now at three people at the bottom. This gets added for you. So we're at three. You're going to need to put in if your parents have any other children they financially support. So we're going to count up any brothers or sisters um, or stepbrothers or sisters and put that number in here. Maybe you have one stepsister who lives in your household. We're going to put a one here. Then are there any other people that live with your parents that they financially support? So maybe Graham lives with you guys because she can't live by herself. We could add her as one person in the household. That number gets added up and it's right here. So we're going to have a household number of how many people are in the household. Um, then it's going to ask how many dependents are going to be in college between July 1st, 2021 and June 30, 2022. Now we know it's always going to be one because that's going to be you, the student, but are there any other dependents that are going to be in college? We're going to count those up and put in that number right there. Now we've got to the financial section. Um, I'm going to show you what the parent financial section looks like, but keep in mind, if you are an independent student and you don't list, need to list parent information, you're going to see the exact same questions, except it's going to be about you, the student. Okay. So under here, you can see, have your parents completed uh, an IRS income tax return for 2019? So your options are they've already completed, will file, or not going to file. So if you are an independent student, keep in mind, this is going to be about you. So let's say that they completed a 2019 tax return. Then these other two questions are going to pop up. What type of income tax return did your parents file? Did they file in a US 1040? That's where most of my students are filing. Or maybe they had some um, foreign income. So maybe they had to file one of these other incomes, um, tax returns. If they filed a 1040 um, and their tax status was either single, head of household, married filing jointly or qualifying widower, you're gonna be able to link to the IRS and pull in all of your tax data. It's awesome. So just keep in mind that people who are married but file a separate return are not gonna be able to link to the IRS. The reason for this is that 
that link that happens, what's going to happen is you're going to leave the FAFSA website and go to the IRS website. The IRS is going to find that tax data and just transfer it all in. It's pretty slick. It's, it's automatic. If your parents file a separate return, or if you, the student, are married filing a separate return, this data retrieval tool has no way of mashing together those two tax returns and pulling in one number. If that's the case where you filed a separate return, you're going to have to manually answer the questions. You're going to have to take the two tax returns, add up the answers, and plug them in by hand. It's okay. I can help you walk that through that if you need. Just let me know. We'll, we'll take care of that. So these are the two different screens that you're going to see. If they met the qualifications and they can link out to the IRS, you're going to see this link out to the IRS button. But like I said, people who file a married filing separate return, there's no way of pulling that data in. So you're going to see this response that says you're unable to transfer the information. You're going to click next and you're going to be hand entering your information at that point. If you or your parents are able to log out to the IRS website and pull in your tax data, um, what you're going to see for parents information is that they need to enter in their username and password, that FSA ID, they're gonna to need to enter that in in order to get to the IRS website. And the reason why they're doing that is they really wanna make sure that we protect the information, the personal information. So that's why the parent sets up their username and password and we're gonna enter it here. So you need to know which parent, if you have two parents on your FAFSA, which one of those parents has the FSA ID? Was it parent one or parent two? So my parent one had the FSA ID, so I'm gonna click parent one. And then if my parents have already set up their FSA ID, I'm gonna enter in the username and password here. But if they haven't done that yet, we can go ahead and click on create the FSA ID. It'll take you right to that website. The parent can create the username and password and they can immediately use it here. So if they don't remember it, like they're trying to enter it and it's not working, you can click on forgot username or forgot password. Um, once you enter in the username and password, it's going to give you a warning sign. You're leaving the IRS, uh, the, the FAFSA website and going to the IRS website. You're going to proceed to the IRS website. The IRS website also has a warning. You're going to say, okay. And then uh, you get to the IRS website. So the FAFSA takes you immediately, takes you right to the IRS website. So you're already there. The IRS is going to verify your identity by saying, what is the address listed on your tax returns? So it's great to have your tax returns with you. You're going to want to enter that in exactly as is listed on your tax return. So here's a couple tricks with this, because sometimes people have an issue trying to get this to work. Enter in your address exactly as listed. So uh, keep in mind that for this example, this person lives at Oakdale Drive. On my tax returns, drive is spelled DR. I'm gonna enter it DR. If on my tax returns it says drive spelled out D R I V E and I enter DR, this may not work. So keep that in mind. Super picky. Another thing to pay attention to is what the tax filing status is. Sometimes if you can't get this to work, I find people have chosen the wrong tax filing status. So you can just change that here. If you have a PO box return, a PO box number on your tax return, you're going to list just the PO box number. Don't write in PO box. Just put in the number here. You're going to hit submit. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, the IRS found your tax data. It's going to say, look at all this data that we found. We're going to take all this information and we're going to pull it into your FAFSA automatically. Awesome. So you're going to check off, yes, I do want to transfer my information and transfer it now. When that pulls in to your FAFSA, you're not going to be able to see what was transferred in. All you're going to see that this question has already been answered for you. So just keep in mind, you can't see that information, but just know that it is correct. Um, some people have questions about things that are, are not on their tax returns, but it still says transferred. Like um, maybe the question is about, do you have an education credit where maybe they didn't have an edu education credit on their tax returns? Don't worry, what was transferred in was a zero. So that's okay. 
So if you were not able to use IS data retrieval, like either you didn't qualify for or you couldn't get it to work, no problem. You can go ahead and just hand enter your information in from your tax returns. Keep in mind, this is a great time. If you're not sure like what exactly they're looking for, it does tell you where to find it on your tax return. It tells you the exact line. Keep in mind that this question mark icon will pull up exactly what they're looking for. And also make sure you have your federal tax return. I had someone the other day who had a state tax return and they couldn't figure out why this, this number wasn't, there wasn't a number there. It's because they were looking at their state tax return. We need the federal ones. So if you have two parents on your FAFSA, um, this question is gonna be have to be hand entered. This is how much income from work did each parent have? Cause that's not something that IRS data retrieval can do automatically. It can't take the one line of income and separate it into two people. So basically I tell people grab your W-2s, that wage statement that you got from your employer, um, add up all the box ones if you have multiple W-2s and put in that answer here. But you can also see from the tax return where to pull that data. Maybe you have a business or a farm, you might have a schedule one. So this will tell you exactly where to look for it. So if your parents' income is below a certain amount, you're gonna have a simpler FAFSA, meaning you're gonna see a lot less questions. If you ever see a question that says, do you wanna skip questions about your parents' assets? Or do you wanna skip questions about your income and your parents' income and assets? We always say yes to this. Um, anytime we can skip questions is great because even if you do enter any information, it doesn't count. This is designed to be an easier process. The FAFSA already knows you're gonna qualify for more financial aid, so it doesn't need more information. So we're always just gonna say yes to that. Um, if you are asked about additional parent information here, just keep in mind, I go line by line with these. Just take your time. Um, again, choose those question mark icons if you're not exactly sure what they're asking for. Um, but I did wanna point out that this is a question that often gets overlooked and I think it's super important. So when I left my old job and I went to my new job, I had a retirement account with my old job that I wanted to pull into my new job so I could keep adding money to it. That's called a rollover. Um, what happened when I pulled that money out from my old retirement account, it showed up as income on my tax return. The FAFSA wants to take that out. They need to pull that out because it's not income you have to work with. It's money that you move from one account to another. So it's important when you look at your tax return to look at this amount and say, was that a rollover or did you actually pull out money from your retirement account that you have available to help pay for college? So if it was a rollover, you're gonna enter the amount of the rollover. And usually it says that on your tax returns. Super important. Another important thing to know is on your tax return, was any of that income from work study or a co-op? So this is income that you got from financial aid. So it's not actually, I wouldn't say it's like not actually income. It's gonna be for FAFSA purposes considered aid that you received. So this is a place where you're gonna enter in how much you earned from say work study and it's gonna exclude that income from your FAFSA. This is another question that people often miss. So I just wanted to point out here, um, payments to tax deferred pensions. This is information from your W-2. So grab out all your W-2s and look at box 12A through 12D. If you have any numbers there, look at the codes next to them. We are only gonna count these codes, D, E, F, G, H, and S. If there's another code like DD, we are not gonna include that amount here. So that's a question people get wrong often. Now the next question is gonna be asking about assets. You may not see this question. If your income is below a certain amount, you won't see it, that's fine. You are able to skip it, that's great. Um, but what we're asking here is about assets. Assets means what do you have for available cash maybe. So it's gonna come up with an amount. And if your assets exceed that amount, or if you're not sure, what are we talking about here? 
Um, you can check on the little assets. It's going to link to what to list and what not to list. Super important. Um, but if you're not sure, you click on yes. This pops up showing what exactly the three categories are of assets. And this is a question people often get wrong. So super important. We need to know what to list and what not to list. So we're going to look at as of today, what is the total of the cash checking and savings accounts? This is how much liquid money you have. Like how much money do you have total that you could just write a check for and have available to you? This question is about investments, including real estate, not the home, not the primary home where you live in. We are not gonna list that. There are other things that we're not gonna list and that's where I say, check on that little question mark icon we are not going to list retirement accounts. So if you have a 401k, we're not listing that. Um, if you do have like stocks and bonds, you are going to list that. Okay. So those things are questionable whether or not to list. What we're looking for for real estate is maybe you have a second property like a camp. You would list the net value of this. By net value, I mean what it's worth minus any debt you have on it. So maybe you have a mortgage, you wanna like just get the net value. So it's the, the net value minus any debt that you have on it. Um, we're not gonna list any possessions, boats, cars, jewelry, not gonna be listed here. Then we get down to businesses. We're only looking for businesses with over hundred employees. So super important to know about these assets and what they're looking for here. Um, on our get ready to file the FAFSA checklist, on the bottom, we do have a list. I, I have the green arrow pointing towards the assets we do list on the FAFSA. But then you can, uh, again, also see what we are not going to list on the FAFSA. So super important. That's super helpful at famemain.com. Um, we have a lot of tools here that you can use for free. So um, the next questions you're going to see is about the student financial section. It's gonna be the same questions about taxes that we saw before. Did you complete a 2019 income tax return? If you did, you the student can also link to the IRS and pull in your tax data. So just keep in mind the parents' questions are very similar to what the students are gonna see. Um, also very important here, um, some students don't file a tax return, they didn't have to, but they did work and they got a W-2. They got a statement from their employer saying how much they earned in that entire year. So important that people hang on to those W-2s, even if you don't file a tax return, because that's where you're gonna, you will be asked about income. Even if you didn't file a tax return, you will be asked about income. Okay, so we're now at the end of this. This section here, the sign and submit section, gives you the option of looking at all the questions that you've answered. And if there's anything that you wanna change, you can pop into that little hyperlink and it um, will allow you to change that question. Then you're going to sign your FAFSA. We're so close to being done. So um, you're gonna click on provide student signature and it's gonna have you agree to some terms um, that you are not stealing someone's identity and that you're gonna use financial aid to pay for college. Um, you're going to um, provide your signature. Remember, your signature is that username and password. So when you logged into the FAFSA, you've already kind of signed your FAFSA. That piece is already added for you. You just have to agree to the terms. So this is what it looks like when you agree to the terms. You click agree and hit next. Sign this FAFSA. When you click on sign this FAFSA, um, it's going to say signed electronically. If parent information is needed on your FAFSA, you're gonna click sign as the parent. Then you're gonna to have to figure out if you have two parents on your FAFSA, which one of them has the FSA ID. So I can look at these two um, people and I can see, oh, this is my social my date of birth. I'm, I'm parent two, I have the FSA ID. I'm gonna click sign as parent. Um, I'm gonna um, put in my username and password if I didn't have to already when I link to the IRS. If I didn't, that's fine. I can go ahead and put it in here. If you don't have an FSA ID, created, you can click on create an FSA ID. If you don't remember what it is, sometimes I have trouble remembering what mine is, forgot username or forgot password, then sign this FAFSA. So you can see here, the student has signed electronically and the parent has signed electronically. Now I can click on submit my FAFSA. 
So on this congratulations screen, at first I want you to say, yes, I did it. Congratulations, it's done. Um, but also if you have a brother or sister that needs to fill out your FAFSA, uh, fill out their FAFSA, click on this, it will open up a new FAFSA and pull over all that parent information you entered already. So you don't have to re-enter it, amazing. Um, another thing to check in on is expected family contribution. This is the results of the FAFSA. This is the end result number. Um, the name of it is misleading. This is not money that you have to pay to go to school. This is just a number saying, um, if I worked in financial aid, I'd look at that number and say, okay, for this aid program, maybe it's a Pell Grant, they qualify for this much. So this basically tells the financial aid office what aid programs you qualify for. So I would say pop that open and maybe you can get an idea of what kind of federal aid is available to you. Keep in mind, the FAFSA doesn't know about, are you gonna qualify for Maine State Grant? Does the college that you listed, did they have any financial aid? So this is just a preliminary finding of how much aid you might get. This is going to show you a little bit further on down the screen, all the colleges that you listed. So after processing, once you get that congratulations screen, that's been sent out to all those schools listed. After a couple of days, you're gonna get an email that says your student aid report is available to view. This is the follow-up portion, right? So I want you to log back into fafsa.gov and you're gonna see your FAFSA was processed. Um, you can view or print your student aid report. So click on that link and it pulls up a one page summary of everything you said on the FAFSA. Go ahead and just take a look at that and see if anything needs to be fixed. Maybe you listed you know, something that was incorrect. You can go in to make FAFSA corrections and you can update your FAFSA. If you um, listed 10 schools and you found another school that you want to list, um, you're gonna click on make corrections, go in and add that school and resubmit it. Easy peasy. So I also wanna mention that uh, many people when they're filing the FAFSA note that the list on the FAFSA has changed. And this is particularly important in 2020. We've worked with so many students and families who have lost jobs or are making less income. There has always been a process in place called an appeal, or sometimes schools call it a professional. This is where you contact the financial aid office to say, I know my FAFSA says this, but this is my situation now. You're going to work with the financial aid office to document your situation and the financial aid office will adjust your FAFSA to reflect what your position is now. It's just a way to better reflect your family's ability to pay for college. So keep in mind that options available. Um, other reasons to do this, um, you know, maybe you've lost a job, but maybe since you filed FAFSA, you've um, either had a divorce or a separation. There were two incomes in the household, now those incomes is gone. Um, I've had parents pass away after filing the FAFSA and we need to remove one of the incomes. Um, sometimes you have unusual expenses. Like I have a parent I'm working with who is um, undergoing treatment for cancer. So not only is she not working as much, she has a loss of income, but now she has medical expenses, transportation costs to get to Boston and stay there. So there's a lot of additional expenses the FAFSA doesn't ask about. So that is a process that you can do. I firmly, firmly um, say people should ask about this. It's not weird or uncomfortable. Financial aid office is very used to dealing with this. We created um, a steps to appeal financial aid offer instructions, just to give you a little bit more information about what this process is about and how to go through it. So you can find that at famemain.com. So that is it for me today. I would love to have you guys go to our website, famemain.com slash education. We have a ton of information there, free to use for you. Reach out to us. We're here to help you through the process, um, but also follow us on our social media. We have Facebook and Instagram where we post scholarships that are available. Um, we have a YouTube channel where we have these cute little animated videos on how to set up your FSA ID or um, information about student loans and repayment. Um, we also have a Twitter account. So follow us on our social media accounts. There's a lot more information to be had there. So 
Thanks for joining me today. Hope you have a great day.